Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Matt Panish here. Um, ahead of the opening of the exhibition, which was part of the Morecambe uh, International Film Festival, or the Bay International Film Festival, I spoke with the photographer, Norrie McLaren, who worked with Stanley Kubrick when he was 23 years old, and worked with him on Barry Lyndon and The Shining, and kept in touch with him. And he reflected on his time working with Kubrick. Uh, and so, uh, Norrie... Uh, lovely to speak to you. Um, could I ask you, uh, when did you first start working for Stanley? Right at the beginning. He just finished Clockwork Orange and he was about to do Napoleon. Wow. Um, and so that, that's the reason why he did Barry Lyndon. He'd done all this research for uh, Napoleon and he thought, well, I've got to choose another one. I must admit, I was quite strained. It, it's, it's something like it's the... History of Henry Esmond or something. I can't remember. You'd have to look it up. Uh, and um, it was actually, um, it was it was strange. I thought, what a strange choice. You know, to me, it was a strange choice. Uh, but um, he, he was happy with it, obviously. I mean, you know, Stanley works in his own way. He's got, it's all going on in his mind. And sometimes you get a sense of what he wants to do. Uh, I felt, and then sometimes you, you wonder what's going on, but actually it is all there. He's quite tight about it, but he, I mean, he's free with uh, um, uh, expressing ideas and, and stuff like that. And that's what made him so interesting to work with because, you know, you, the conversations ranged from all sorts of stuff and he'd have dreams and he'd tell you what he was dreaming about. And, and you know, he'd, he'd give you certain little narratives and, and then at the same time, you have the whole thing going on on the phones, and which you you bring up. And I, I this is one of the things that I remember very well is um, a policeman rang up from New York and said he had a parking ticket, but Stanley hadn't paid his parking ticket. And I actually took it off. You know, I believed him for a while. And I thought, you know, what do I do with this? Do I interrupt Stanley saying that there's a policeman that needs some money? And I, I was sort of slightly suspicious. Uh, and because then in those days it was a different way we all were we weren't so cautious and yeah. uh oh well stanley was particularly cautious because the security of even getting into his house was difficult anyway this policeman i said oh hold on i'll just uh, i'll transfer you and i and, I, and then i spoke to i it was the one day i wasn't often in the office doing that sort of stuff and um and i sort of worked out the, the switches and things and i got through to stanley i said stanley there's a policeman from, from New York says you haven't paid a parking fine. And he's wrong. Oh, he said, is that Peter Sellers? And, I said, and it just suddenly clicked. And it was Peter Sellers ringing up. So, you know, you get that the whole time. And Peter Sellers would ring the whole time. So you get these sort of weird narratives going on. And, and you just have to kind of run with it and just, you know, you know leave it to Stanley. He'll deal with it. It's his problem. <laughs> That's awesome. How old were you at the time? Yeah, I was about 22, 23, something like that. Okay. Yeah, I was sort of, yeah, I must have been about that. I'd come back from the East uh, and, uh, yeah, I was 21 uh, in Malaysia uh, on top of a train. And I remember then I got back um, and I wanted to, I'd left school. I went to school in the Highlands in Scotland, which is a, a, an infamous place now. It's closed down. It was a Benedictine monastery, and it's 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 you know one of the forefront of all the abusing monks and stuff like that. There's a big no. narrative going on there. I mean, I personally never really um, never never saw this sort of stuff, but anyway, it came out, and it's 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 high in the news of, in in the Scottish news, or has been over the last few years. Right. Anyway, it's closed down, and when I left, I wanted to be a scriptwriter. So a kind of young lad from the Highlands. Uh, Wanting to be a scriptwriter was kind of not, I mean, I knew nobody at all, absolutely nobody at all. Uh, but actually, I sort of got lucky. I, I, there was a whole lot of people that came up to ski and they came to, they, they came to stay with me. And they brought this young man who was a guy called Tim Stone. Now, Tim Stone uh, had obviously just left school. Uh, and I'm just, just a little bit of background here. And he... Uh, he was the son of Richard Stone. Richard Stone is the big agency that did, did, did all the vaudeville acts, Benny Hill, did every comedian at all of them. That's, that was what he was. And he, they, his, his father's died. Uh, the Stone Age, I think it's, it's, it's been swallowed up by another agent. 
actually Tim has been in Los Angeles and he opened an office in New York and he's just retired and he's back here and actually he's contacted me. We, we're in contact again. Awesome. But that was kind of how I, the way I kind of knew things were going on because I went down and lived in their house and um, for he, I said it was only going to be for a couple of weeks until I got a job. But in fact, apparently I stayed there for a couple of months. But it was great. He was very generous. I mean, you know, I mean, I met, you know, I go, I, I went back one day and sort of I'm wandering a bit, but I went back one day and, and you know, and I sat down and there suddenly who came to tea was Nina Simone. So suddenly, you know, there I am as a 23 year old. I'd never heard of Nina Simone. And of course, there you meet her. Uh, with a guy, with a comedian, a New York comedian called Dick Gregory, a black comedian. And so that was the act that uh, Richard Stone was obviously putting on. So I kind of met all these people. So what it, it, it transpired that I met a, a photographer, and I don't remember how. He's a photographer called Dimitri Castorine, and he just worked for Stanley on Clockwork Orange. And he did all the stills for Stanley. And um, and I'd worked with him for about a week doing stuff for the Sunday Times Color Supplement, which has just started then. So maybe that gives it a date. Um, so anyway, and, and I remember working with him. And we I'd never worked in the studio before, but I, I obviously did it all right. And I kind of, you know, and, and it worked. And the lighting I got right. And, and he was very impressed. I, I, might, I don't know. Somebody must have been looking over at me. And, I don't know who told me how to do it, but I just did it. And um, so he then said at the end, oh, Stanley, I've, you know, Stanley rang me the other day and he's looking for a photographer. Would you, would you mind if I put your name forward? And I said, no, fine. I didn't really think about it after. And a few weeks later, I got a call from a guy called uh, Andros Ipamenondas. And he was Stanley's assistant and um, Andros and I went to see them up at Abbot's Mead in, at Radlett in Borehamwood, and I met Stanley. And, you know, that was how it happened. And I was asked in to do some plate work, uh, which I did with another photographer called John Passmore, who was a son of the artist Victor Passmore. And he and I, because John was a, he taught photography at college. So basically he was a great guy for me to learn from as well. Right, right. So he kind of kept me kept kept me up to speed technically because I really wasn't I hadn't kind of actually become a photographer. Well, I had because I had a camera and I was taking pictures, and you know, obviously, uh, but I wasn't making a living at it. But yeah. I was trying to work out how to make a living. So this door opened for me. So there I am. I, I you know, I got lucky. I walked through. You know, you make your luck. And actually, the luck was fantastic. I walked through the door, and there I was. Hi, I'm Stanley. Hi, I'm Norrie. And that's always been the way it is. It's a bit, you know, I'd be, I instantly thought, well, if Stanley does that to me, I'm going to do it to everybody else. And that's kind of what it, he sort of uh, guided me in terms of uh, film politeness. And, um, and Stanley, we hit it off straight away. Uh, and I'm, I mean, the key thing about working with people, I feel, in now I've, you know, been down the road a bit and I've obviously worked for other people. Uh, Stanley was great, but also, you know, the big thing about Stanley is to get to know the family. And that's why I started this exhibition with a, with a, with a note from Vivian, who was a little kid then, um, but she was a great kid. And very engaging, and you know, and I just got to know the family. And because you work so hard, Stanley, I mean, you do work seven days a week, and you know, literally, you know, do you want to really go home? I mean, you know, I I started. Um, he, the one thing he really did teach me how to do was to play table tennis. Wow, Stanley wow. was a demon at table tennis. <laughs> and that's that's the way. Every night we would play tennis. I'd finish work at about I don't know seven or eight maybe nine and then we have an hour's table tennis every night and sometimes other people came to play i mean uh marco mcdowell came to play one night he was beaten by stanley as well he was sharp as a button he he just i could i never beat him and i got better and better and i'm not bad at table tennis and i and you know and i actually could never beat him that's incredible it's what i, it's what I always tell people you know always i mean if you want to do anything in life play with people or work with people that are better than you and you will learn. It's like, if you want to learn how to play golf, 
play with a really professional golfer. Always get beaten. But if you've got the drive to win, you will actually become better at it. You might not beat them, but yeah. you will be a better golfer. I yeah. don't play golf, but I do play table tennis. But and, and it was it was something that I, you know, and he was fierce. <laughs> and he had a little he, it was like a little um uh sort of um I'm trying to think of those the names of those uh, those shelters, bomb shelters in in Anderson, Anderson shelters. Anderson you know, shelters. He had it. He had it built in the back of uh, Abbot's Mead in the garden. The garden wasn't very much; it was just trees, and, and he wasn't very into gardening. And so I um, and and we played ten- table tennis there every night. And it was uh, he he got really good. At, he was so good. I mean, That's you know. incredible. I mean, I've, I've heard about Kubrick, the chess player, and Kubrick. Oh, the... Absolutely. I've had that too. I knew that too. So <laughs> this was table tennis. We never played chess. I, I can play chess, but I never played chess with him. That's so incredible. we played table tennis. That's great to hear. So um, uh, you, we, we mentioned this series of photographs uh, that we've got. So um, could I ask you to, to talk us about the overview of that? Uh, well, I had, um, I used to always, I mean, I'd always done this uh, before I even met Stanley. I'd sort of had uh, Nikon F1's backs, and I had three of them, and I'd always have two running in the bag uh, that was a colour and a black and white, if that was the jobbing camera I was using. But there was always one other camera that I had, which I'd pick up and take odd snaps with every now and then. And this was also the camera that I'd take some of these pictures with. And I didn't find, I'd, I'd sometimes not know I had a picture for months or sometimes years because I, and I've still got some rolls of film, and I'm pretty sure they're not standees, but they're old rolls, and I will at some point process them and see what the, what's on them. Wow. But that's, what I've, that's the sort of way, I've always had one camera that I could, I, I had that told a bit of a story of where, what I was doing over the, that was my, my narrative. And sometimes, you know, I'd be doing, and, and, you know, I've got some roles of film where I'm at Speaker's Corner and then suddenly you've got, uh, um, I don't know, a, a sort of naked model or something. But, you know, there's, there's something that, because I became a fashion photographer as well, so I actually sort of had, I was dipping into lots of um, areas yeah. and it was fascinating for me anyway. Oh, wow, that's wonderful. Skills. <laughs> that's incredible so um with this series we've started off with a a, a copy of vivian's uh letter to yourself Vivian. yeah yes yeah i just thought that was the way because it's to me it was always about the reason for 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 getting on with stanley was you know i mean literally you did become part of the family and that was the only way he could actually get you into it and, and the first christmas i came up to stanley he said you don't want to go home come and stay and have christmas with us in fact i said no i really do want to go back to my family <coughs> here in scotland and and um and that was and i did but he gave me a, i remember he gave me a, a book um, a, a film, a, an encyclopedia of film, and it was the best one that he'd chosen it because it was a good write-up of him, and, <laughs> um, and so I've still got it. And it's um, it was it was just that. But other times I worked solidly. I mean, when we were on Barry Lyndon, I, I needed to pace myself, but and every now and then I'd I'd use Sunday just to go for a walk with the production secretary who's a mate and we'd just go let's go for a big walk and fresh air we need to get away from all this high but you know a lot of it was 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 very you know you do work very hard with Stanley well you work hard on any movies yeah but usually they end in about 12 weeks time you know the trouble is with Stanley it goes on for years <laughs> and, it, and and you know you do need to you know take time out sometimes no, it's, well, Barry Lyndon was quite a long development process, wasn't it? It was a long development process, and then the filming process went on. It's one I was looking at some call sheets and stuff like that, and you know the the plan, you know the the first schedules he started putting. I mean, the ending it was all it changed the whole time, and 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 the whole thing changed, and you really didn't know what was going on. Sometimes there was a sort of narrative, you know, you vaguely knew the narrative, but. Um, I, it wasn't often, I didn't really get on the set a lot because that wasn't my role. I yeah. wasn't the official photographer like Dimitri had been. They used a guy called Keith Hampshire 
And John and I talked about this the other day, and I've always realized, we talked about it some time ago, but we had another conversation about it, is why we never got any credit. And, and Ken Adam was actually quite fierce about that with Sam. He said, you know, why do you not, you know, because we did a lot of work for this. And, and, you know, and I had a lot of architectural skills. I knew a lot about buildings. There were moments when he'd think of filming, you know, I'd take, I'm thinking about uh, Ryan's wedding to uh, Marisa. And, uh, and it literally, she, she was walking out of Victorian church to a, a, a sort of a, a, a lovely stately home. And I said, that's, you can't have that. That's, that's the wrong period. <laughs> and he that and those are the sorts of things that every now and then I could throw into it. Wow. Uh, well, I threw it into Ken and then Ken passed it on to Stanley. Wow. So in a way, um, you know, but it was, uh, you know, I mean, John and I agreed. We weren't members of the union then, you see. And right. I remember times when uh, the union, Alan Sapper, who ran the union then, the ACTT, <coughs> he came to the set twice, I think, in, in in Ireland, and I was hidden in a cupboard. You know. <laughs> Fantastic! You could you couldn't employ you know, yeah, young, uh, people with no skills or not the sort of skills they felt you know. But it didn't take long to pick up the skills. You know, I didn't think it was that hard. Oh, so did you join the union in the end? <laughs> you... In the end, I did. In the end, I did. Yes, but many years later. But I went. I went up to see, and it was actually I didn't. I didn't bother becoming a member of the union for ages because. I, I was also became a member of another association which covered me for that. Right. And, um, and, uh, but it was also, I, I went up to see Stanley when he was, for, when he was editing Full Metal Jacket. And, um, and I, I wanted, and he signed my membership, you know. Oh, right. Oh. But I, so I didn't really, um, I didn't really, um, I never bothered with the union after that because it wasn't that necessary. Because I became a producer. And when Channel 4 started, I started doing lots of stuff for Channel 4. So I became a producer director and, and you know, where we, we had our own association, which yeah. is now called Pact. Right. OK. OK. Fantastic. So uh, these photographs, then, I'm going to go straight to number two, uh, which yeah. is uh, John Passmore and Jan Harlin sort out the projector. <laughs> Well, the projector was the thing that John and I were called in to work with. It's a Devere projector, and he he he'd found that he could actually project these 10 8 plates because <coughs> he was going to shoot the whole thing on with front projection. He wasn't going to do any sets at all. Right. And we and we why John and I were asked to photograph. We would at nights we would go and photograph stately homes for him. Because that was the only time they were empty. We could put all sorts of lighting rigs up and everything we could do just to, just to make it look good for his photographs. And he sort of, he wanted to do that. And, it, and so therefore he had the, the front projection plate of the screen up at Elstree Studios. And then when we went to Ireland, he was put up at Ardmore Studios. And I believe after that, it was taken down and taken back to England, back to Elstree, but he never used it. I think, uh, I think eventually it was wrapped up and they decided it wasn't good. He obviously stunned me, was, it got too much into filming locations and he enjoyed it. Mm. Uh, and so therefore that's what, and John, that is the projector that they were going to use. And John, that's John Passmore, who he and I, and you'll see along the side of the, of the of that room there's all sorts of stills and pans basically we became what i felt i was really for stanley because he was uh he was not very good at dealing with people i mean he had a it, within the film business and it was fine but if you, the general public he found and we were basically his eyes right and that's that's the movie in locations on the wall, we put them on the wall, and this was his garage at Abbey, right. his home, which eventually was closed down because the council said this is ridiculous. There's too much electricity and too much stuff going on there, You're, and it's only a garage. It's meant to be. It's not meant to be a, a film studio, <laughs> which Stanley Stanley constantly turned it into. You know. Right. Okay. So, so he kind of mapped out, as you say, you were his eyes. We so ma mapped we mapped out, out the story. film for him. Absolutely. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that, it's kind of what we did. And, and at the beginning, there was me and John, and then Milena Cananero, who went on to do costumes. Milena was doing pictures, 
And then there was another guy, another artist called An Andrew Lanyon. I think he's, uh, there's a famous artist, I think, called Peter Lanyon, part of the sort of whole St. Ives thing set. And that was his son. That was his son. And, that, and then we had for a, a short while, I mean, only for about a week, we had a guy called Charlie Settrington, who is now, I believe, the Duke of Richmond or something. Anyway, he's some tough. And... Um, and I think uh, he didn't do very much. I, I do remember when his pitch, pictures came in, because what we do is we'd film it all. And then at the end, when we got the film back the next day, we do a speed development. And then we 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 join it all and we run it in a reel. So we could sit with in, in that particular room. Uh, he had one end was a, a little screening room. And so what we would do is we would just pull them through and talk to him through all the locations. We wow. give him the point of views. We give him all the, the various things he needed. We'd have we weren't we weren't measuring it, but we if it was too noisy, if there were airplanes, you know, obviously we couldn't shoot there. I mean, there were things we we got to know. He'd done a circle, an hour from London from L Street Studios. He did a circle all the way round, and that was our that's what we had to search that wow. whole area, and we we did it on very very detailed ordnance survey maps. So he wanted us to know what everything was. I mean, he was really, he really, he really did want us to see it. We had to take pictures, even if it was no good. We'd just take a snap of it, so we could say this is no good, and we'd tell him why this wasn't no good. Noise, or or there was a, a motorway just literally running at the foot of the garden, or whatever it might be. I mean, that happened, and and that really did happen when we when we when we moved to Ireland. Is I remember. Um, Ken suddenly got worried We, because Ken and I had been in Ireland and Jack, the, the other art director, setting it up. I stayed in Waterford where we actually did set up a, a studio and stuff like that. And then he went off to Dingle and, and I used to go over and see him and talk to him about it because it was, a, you know, we were over for about two or three weeks before Stanley came over. But I remembered he said at one point, the evening before Stanley was arriving, he said, come on, we have you checked the road from the ferry, Ross Air Ferry, to Waterford to make sure that Stanley doesn't, because he'll look over and see a building and you'll think, oh, that's a good building. We have to make sure that we can answer the why that's not a good building or, or <laughs> all that. So that's kind of the way you work with Stanley. That's fantastic. He's quite detailed. Incredibly so. Uh, so the next photo is Stanley with Jack Maxted and Ken Adam. Yeah. 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 Well, they, Jack, we had a lot of art directors. I mean, eventually we had a guy called Roy Walker who stayed on. Um, Stanley had, a, um, um, Ken had a nervous breakdown at some point and left the movie um, um, in Ireland. And um, and and uh, he took over. Um, but I think uh, Ken was given the, the production credit, you know. But when he went away to, to rare, he needed a holiday. He, you know, uh, Ken was older than all of us. And, and obviously, you know, he'd been, he'd worked with Stanley from, from the beginning, you know. Yeah. Well, not from, uh, but from, you know, Dr. Dr. Strange Dr. Life and all that sort of stuff. You know, that, those were his sets. And he was the big Bond guy, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, there was a, a rumor that he d uh, that Stanley did the lighting, I think, for your eyes only, or something tweaked it, I think. Um, yeah, I don't well, know. Stanley, the, the, there's 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 basically, um, uh, I would say John Olcott was the, the DOP. Um, he'd obviously worked with Stanley on Clockwork Orange and stuff, but Stanley did all the lighting himself. We did all the lighting tests without even seeing John. I mean, in that particular room where you have the, you know, we we do lighting tests, candle tests to see, testing his lenses and stuff like that. So we got involved in all that sort of stuff as well. I mean, you know, it was like a little team. None of us did it, but we were all very willing to do all sorts of stuff. You know, it was it was um, it was intriguing because you know it gave me a, the basis of you know a sort of a way of working which you know I still obviously do today. But um, it changed. I mean, uh, just jumping ahead a bit, this is the fact that when we did this, we did Jan, his, his brother-in-law, German. They had this Germanic filing system called the definitive system. 
and it was all to do with colours and letters. And I always remember the production the crew, you know, they, they do, you know, filing. You'd just be in, you know, I don't know, lighting, drama. You know, you'd put it in simple, in a simple way. But no, this was all to do with you could know exactly who'd sent you the letter because it was a little left, a little E or something. So it was from Edward. You know, it was, it was amazingly complicated system. Very Germanic, right? <laughs> I've still got a box of all the, the little tags, but I don't have any of the stuff to go with it. <laughs> and when I went back to work with Stanley on, on The Shining, the first thing, he rushed, he dragged my arm and dragged me into the office and into his office. And, and he said, what's different? And looking around, the, all the files were boxes with little lab labels on the front saying what's in it. I said, oh, that's good. Thank God you haven't got that system anymore. And he laughed. So obviously he has some, I mean, it's his brother-in-law, so I don't know what, how they got out of it, but, you know, obviously Stanley didn't like it because the whole, nobody liked it. All the secretaries, the PAs, everybody was going mad with this thing um, <laughs> because Jan, had, he'd have to do it because he wanted to impress his brother-in-law. There we go. Uh, so you worked back with Stanley on The Shining, uh, yes, I came back to work for him for a bit, but then I did another picture. I just based myself actually in his office, in his house, <coughs> and then I did. Um, I did uh, during the shining. I I had a contract to go and do some work for Michael Winner on the, the Long Good Friday, not the Long Good Friday. Um, oh, what is that movie? Anyway, the point is, I didn't really, I did the contract. It was out of Pinewood. I, I really didn't enjoy working for Michael Winner. He was a very difficult man. And really? He, it, it really sort of right, it put me off. And I just did the contract. I didn't, John apparently went on and worked as a, an AD on it. But he hmm. obviously had time to do it. And I didn't, I did, I just couldn't stand him. We just really didn't hit it off at all. Right, okay. I... But then everybody, uh, people were very surprised that they even stayed working. I mean, I did uh, four weeks or something for it. And I said, um, and people were actually surprised I even lasted that long. It's Nobody not... liked Michael Winner. He's a well-known, horrible man to work for. That was just him. That was just a break. And then I went back and did some work. Just at the beginning of The Shining, I, you know, I did, uh, I did some locations. I mean, it actually happened because I was, I was sleeping. I came up here to just sleep and get a bit of rest. And um, he rang me up and, and said, oh, if I sent a camera up, because I had a Beetle, VW Beetle, like um, Jack Nicholson had a, in the beginning, you know, and he wanted me to find the Overlook in the Highlands. He thought there must be something here. And I know the Highlands quite well, so I didn't, and I, I went to a few places, and, um, and these old hydros were, there's one of them, which was in... Um, which was in Peebles Hydro, was basically the, the corridors and things of the Overlook. And because it, it was perfect, it was really that sort of bizarre looking place, bland. And, uh, and so it was very, anyway, that, I just did some film. And I did some filming. He wanted to see, I, he sent me a, a, a tripod and a camera, wind up and just do some film, you know, and well, see what you can get. And um, and so it was fun to do that. And then I and then I started doing work for him uh, on the beginning of The Shining. And I worked for him, I think, for a couple of months. But then I couldn't. I, I had other things. I got into. I got out of working with Stanley. Uh, but I loved him. I lo I I we got on so well. That's what's so nice about him. And even when I went to see him the last time, I, I saw him just before he started Eyes Wide Shut. And he was really unbelievably friendly. It's as if we'd never parted. He was, yeah. fat, you know, he just went on about the same old things. And because I knew him so well, it was easier for me to be with him. And the thing about Stanley is he obviously builds a trust. I mean, if you work for somebody, uh, you build a relationship and it was okay. Um, uh, and so it was quite good. I mean, the trust was good. I, I, I enjoyed him as a friend. I enjoyed him as a, as a person to be with. He was fun. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, everybody then, else, everybody else used to be tired, you know, because of the way he works. They got very tired of it, you know. And um, I must admit that I, my last Stanley thought was on when he when he done eyes wide shut and and they they'd broken for Christmas 
and there was a picture of Tom and Nicole. Well, there wasn't a picture. It, they went and did an interview with Michael Parkinson or something, and they wanted to get it. And I, I looked at them, and they were grey, they were tired, they were knackered, and I thought, I know that look. That's <laughs> working for Stanley Kubrick look. And I've long, I've longed to see Tom and, and talk one day. I mean, I don't think I will, but you know, it's just something I recognised. And I thought, wow, I saw that. <laughs> even even he gets it. <laughs> how long yes. how were you in Ireland for? I can't remember. <laughs> I've forgotten. It was over. A, I mean, it was, a, it was about a year and a half. I think. So there's, there's quite a, a bit, bit of longer that ended yeah. up in the final film. Yeah. Yeah, Did I she... left it at one point. Then I came back again because there was a point when we were everybody was fired because they, you know, they ran out of money. Right, there was okay. an awkward point, and uh, then I kind of then we all kind of obviously picked up other movies, and a lot of people went off, and then they moved back to England, and I, you know, we'd set it up in England already, and so it was quite easy for him to sort of do that. And then I got back in. There was a, I got a call from him one night, in, and he said, "Do I know anybody anywhere where, you know, because he he was really having trouble with the state home type stuff." And I knew I knew one person who had a house who was very private, and I thought they'd get on well with Stanley. And um, it was called Critchell in Dorset, and um, they were kind of old family friends of mine. And I and I rang them up, and they said, "Yeah, sure." Love you to do it, you know. Yeah, and they got on really well with Stanley, and that was great. And you know, in fact, you know, he filmed a lot there, so um, that was kind of interesting. Could I just ask, did did Stanley shoot out of sequence or in sequence? Or I think a lot of it was in sequence, but we had trouble. I remember in very early in Ireland, we were doing the dueling scene, and we shot. He shot that out of sequence, and he was worried about the fact that the leaves were going to be turning because he shot some of the stuff earlier with, with very green leaves. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, and then it, <clears throat> there was some joke. I remember cracking a joke. Well, we could paint the leaves, couldn't we? That sort of stuff, you know. Uh, but it was, um, I, he mainly kept in sequence. Right, so yes. Yeah, uh, but there were moments because of the delay and the length and, and a lot of stuff he filmed that he never used. I mean, I think that's that woodland scene was never used. Uh, right. And that's just the riding shot, you know. That's a simple shot. And you've got one of those pictures in there, number 24, which I think is my favourite, which is Stanley with his extended lens on the cameraman's. Well, he's then, Dougie S uh, Slocum was the grip was not the grip, was the, he was a clapper loader then. And then he became the, you know, eventually his main cameraman. Right. We looked at loads of ruins. I never really understood what, well, it was either for the house, uh, which we eventually got, it was a croft type of thing. Uh, but this, you know, was dueling, you know, he just, battle scenes. Well, a lot of it was for battle scenes because in Ireland then there were a lot of ruined houses. So it's perfect to shoot a battle scene, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually you get there, yeah. How how big was the... Because um, obviously, I mean, the cast and the extras were fairly huge. I mean, it was an epic. Oh, yeah. It was enormous. How big you know, was the... I mean, the crew. Mm. Like the well, it seemed to be quite a small crew. I mean, I've... You know, there's lots... I mean, I have stills of, of you know, the art department. You know, there's just one person filing away. I mean... You know, uh, there's the Ackland Snows were the one. Terry, Ackland Snow did a lot of it. I mean, it was <clears throat> because of props. I mean, obviously, the wardrobe is important. The location is important. And then the props are rather minimal in a way because, you know, he wasn't. Uh, I mean, they were making up flags. They were doing, you know, crests to put on the side of, of carriages and things like that. And. Um, it was all kind of different in a way. I mean, it wasn't there. Wa there wasn't a major rebuilding of anything because they were using the sets, so yeah. the furniture was there already in Wilton House and in all the places they went to. Um, I mean, there was moments like I mean, I just remember one moment. I wasn't there, but I remember being told by the boom operator whose name I you'd have to get him from the crew list. I can't remember his name now. Anyway, I remember it was a long shot, and it was um, and it was a, a long shot following uh, Ryan in a carriage all the way up to the door. 
And Stanley had this, he always had his lenses mounted in a holder. So it was quite long when he was holding it. And uh, he walked all the way up and it was strange. And it was a big day. There were lots of soldiers there that day. There were, it, you know, there must have been about, you know, a thousand people there. I mean, it's a big day. Uh, to suddenly, suddenly, he walked up, walked up, right up, right up to the front door of the place and stopped the camera on right into the door, right? And, and then he turned around and he said, I don't like this. It doesn't work for me. So everybody, but halfway up, a lot of people that knew Stanley, this is according to the, the operator, the boom operator, he said that people started packing up because they knew exactly what was going to happen. They could tell by his gait or, or how he was walking that he was going to change. <laughs> so, you know, what do you do, you know, then when you've got all those people that you paid for, and I think this is kind of well, the way Stanley works is obviously this is why I think in a way they came ran into sort of financial trouble with the studios. I mean, the studios were always, you know, having to, you know, cut the budget. Yeah. Because it's, it's getting out of control. But, it, you know, I mean, I'm sure it, it's got out of control and, and they've made a lot of money since, you know, and it worked. Yeah. It was that, you know, and Stanley was quite... Uh, very confident. And I, I mean, I, so he should be. I mean, any director should be. Yeah. But, you know, I adore my feelings about that. I mean, I, I you know, I, sometimes I think there is a slight coldness. I always, you know, and at some point we were doing, before we went to Ireland, he put a, a, um, a container next to his office at, at the house, yet another little building had appeared. And he put a, a dark room in there. And I was there because he, he, he liked, and I would print his prints for him and stuff like that. And it was a point when we used Polaroid at some points, but then we also was we had this very fast pitch way of, of developing pictures, where you can develop a picture quite quickly, but printing it. And it doesn't really fix them. They don't stay for long. And you'll see that when you see my picture, the picture he took of me, which I ran a print off because he wanted to see what it looked like. And therefore... Uh, you know, and it was, it's, and it's, it should be kept in the dark almost, you know, right. it's really sad. I mean, the original I've got, uh, and it's, 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 it, the fix of it wasn't as, as precise. Yeah. So I used to, every now and then when he'd want a picture, and I've got one still that he took of when he was doing Paths of Glory, and there was this, he was there in a dugout with a cameraman, and uh, somebody, well, somebody pulling focus. Uh, a loader, and that was all. There were three people, I think, in there, and it was, it was all simply set up. And I used to go in and say, you know, having had these big days where there's thousands of people on set and stuff like that, you know, why don't you do this? I used to say, I used to, a couple of times I said, I love this. Making films this way is great. You're, you're really, you know, you're not now the big leader on, on a, you know, the camera up. You'll see it in the next lot of photographs that come to you. You oh, know, yeah. the camera up on a stand. I don't think there's any in that one, no. And, you know, those are the ones, that's where he, he loves, you know, when he's directing millions of people. But there are lots of assistant directors who are doing that. And, and uh, Mike Stevenson and, and, uh, and, and Dave Tomlin are the two of the greatest assistant directors we ever had. In fact, we gave them a BAFTA a few years ago. Yeah. Which I thought was great. Lovely. You know, because they are the guys who, who are the assistant directors to every big movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, are you a BAFTA winner yourself, Norrie? Just as a, a question. I'm not a, no, I've been I've been mentioned, but I haven't. I've never. No, I've never. I've never won. Mm. But I'm a member, and I still vote and all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. Uh, so um, I'm just going through these uh, photos. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that sort of uh, leaps out of you that you want to speak about, or that? Well, I I just if you see number twenty two, there's a whole lot of close ups of a soldier. If you yeah. look in the far left-hand corner of that, if you can see it in that, there's Ken Adams just trying to cross from the uh, props department to the art department. Well, the, the art lorry, from the props lorry to the art lorry. And I thought that was quite funny because suddenly, he, you know, it was easy and he got really irritated about the fact that all these bloody soldiers were marching around in front of him. And you can see his little head there. That's, <laughs> I mean, those are just moments. Um, yeah. But I think... 
I mean, I like the idea. There's one of them, which is number... Uh, yes, it's number 29. Yeah. You see Stanley in the distance, and there he is. That was the first military scene we did. And it's the one where Ryan O'Neill fights with Pat Roach. Right, right. And it, that was a good that was a good um, scene. And I like Pat. I went on being a friend of Pat's for for the rest of his life. I mean, I've I've yeah. always you know he was great. I loved him. He's a great character. And if I wanted, he sometimes asked me up to Birmingham. We go and I'd watch him wrestle or whatever. But he he obviously became a big star because he the, everybody all the the, uh, the Temple of Doom and all the sort of uh, you know Harrison Ford movies yeah were, were done where he was there. He was the baddie, you know. And yeah. you could tell him by his arm. His arm was cut. Yeah, I noticed that actually. Just we we screened um, Barry Lyndon um, the weekend before last, and that was yeah. the first time I noticed that the cut in his arm. I knew him as Bomber. That's how I got introduced oh, right. from our oh, feet yeah. playing that. You know that, that he's a great character. He was a great character. Got yeah. going on very well with him. Oh, uh, lovely, lovely. Uh, but yeah. Um, that was a, a great scene as well. The the fight scene between him yeah. and um and Ryan. Yeah. And Ryan, yeah. And that yeah. I noticed um Stanley almost used the same technique as Clockwork Orange in the close up fight between Alex and the cat lady. That really yeah. gets quite yes. into 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 the yeah. acting mm. and making it quite a visceral experience for the viewer in the cinema. Okay. In a way, Stanley was, you've got to remember, he was a photographer. I mean, when I went to the Eyes Wide Shut, when I saw him at that party that uh, Jan gave, mm. um, oh, no, it was Catherine that gave, and, and, um, and it was great to see him. We just talked about cameras. He basically is always been a photographer. I mean, if you look at that, you know, the pictures of, that uh, um, Dimitri took of Stanley doing that fight scene, it's all handheld from different angles. And he's handing, he's winding the arrow. He's doing it all himself, you know. Yeah. And he basically loved that. Yeah. You know, that when he's sort of remote, he loved being close to the technology. And he was always, he got me into half frame cameras. I've never used it again since, but it is, you know, something. And the wider lux, he had a camera that did a pan on a, on a called a wider lux. And I, he just loved that stuff. All right. you know, that's where he was. He's an analog photographer. Right. And he adored it. What's a half frame camera? Sorry. Well, it's just literally a half frame of a thirty five millimeter. You get a, a negative of the size of these little contact sheets. Oh right. Okay. Okay. And what and would he love doing that? And you just wind it up and click, <clears throat> wind it up right. and click. And it was you. Know, you get you know seventy pictures. <laughs> uh, as opposed to 30 odd, you know, and that was kind of what, and it was very grainy and it was kind of interesting. I mean, a lot of people do that sort of stuff now. And also at some point, and John, <clears throat> he, I remember him doing it. He came in with Stanley one day, I remember, and he said, no, why don't we build a camera? And they built a camera. John built it for Stanley. And it was, you know, it's just literally like using a box. You know, you can take a picture with a, with a car, with an old, cardboard box you know yeah. you just take yeah. a hole and put you know you can do all that and he was very into doing trying that he was looking for ways he's always looking he was always looking for new ways of doing things right. and in a way that's where his skills lay i i kind of feel that there was a sort of coldness i remember when i first saw barry linden i went to the screening in the west end in london and i remember there was just one point where there's the, you know, and it, it it's not even, none of the violent scenes are violent at all. It was just that one moment when Ryan with his son and in the, in the it, you know, and that, and that suddenly you, you sit up and you think, wow, you wake up as it were. And the, you, then you get back into the, the music and the visual opulence. And it's, it's beautiful. But I, I, that I suddenly, I always used to think that that's, Stanley needed to be working more on a one-to-one -one level with actors, and you know, yeah. I, I was always, I was, I was, I thought Ryan was a strange casting, anyway. Yeah, but he was a big, he was a big star then, you know. Yeah. Do you do you think that was it? Really, he was. A big yeah, star. I think it shows, but then I mean, it's it's. 
I, a lot of people, a lot of my friends in films say, you know, they they sometimes wonder about Stanley's, why he's why, why he's become. I mean, his body of work is so varied, and he's not, you know, he's not done a Spielberg, gone from one movie to another. He takes time. He thinks yeah. about it. And it's a very expensive process, that, because the research, I mean, the, the exciting time with Stanley is the research, I think. And yeah. that, and, and, you know, when you do, and I, I'm sure latterly he must have got other people doing it for him who would go out and, and be his eyes again, you know. Yeah. Uh, this particularly was awkward because it was a period piece, you know. And so therefore you'd have to, you, you know, I took lots of pictures of the interiors of, of stately homes, which are which weren't so prominent then, and they probably didn't have very much money. And actually some of them look quite nice now because they're so shabby. But I bet you they've all been done up and they're all posh, you know, owned by telephone magnates and, you know, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> you know, life has changed, has moved on so much since Barry Lyndon, since this. I mean, I went to Southern Ireland, I went to Aira uh, at the beginning of the year. And uh, I went to see a friend of mine who's a cameraman out there. And uh, it was great, but it's changed. Yeah. Every, every, there's no, none of the little ruins anywhere. None of that anymore, because everything's been done up, you know. It's been tidied up and... Either and everything's way. been tidied up and it's totally different now. Wow. I mean, the character of the place is the same, but the, the place visually it is totally different. Completely it's different. It's just all right. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to uh, skip to uh, um, number 30, Christiane Kubrick. In the oh, first right. film in Barry Lyndon, she was always supportive of her husband. Yeah, uh, she, she was around a lot. She came on set. I mean, there's a couple of there's a, a couple of pictures of her there. <coughs> I think. I don't know. Maybe she's not in twenty one. Is she in twenty one? What's twenty one? I can't see. You're right. They're very small. One Yes, uh, it is. She's yes, there. Yes, she's, it with is. The, Sorry, she's yeah. with June Randall, the continuity, and Dave Tomlin. Yeah. I mean, they're they're you know. Yes, yeah, she she always was, and it was. I mean, she wasn't. I mean, she obviously when she this was at the beginning, and I think she settled into it eventually because she had her own studio. She was an artist. Mm. And, you know, I remember when she was at Abbott's Mead, we, the office was above her studio in the sort of gatehouse, where it was all very close. I mean, you had to go through a couple of gates to get through and, and tap in numbers and stuff. And it, it was, uh, so he was very, he was a very private man, Stanley. Yeah. And his wife was an artist who liked, I mean, who obviously... I mean, you know, there's a, a great notoriety. She's a good artist, yeah. and she's probably bought by a lot of people. Mm. And uh, but I, I, I liked her. I enjoyed her. She was a nice. She was a good person. She's still alive, I believe, about yeah. ninety. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Which is great. And you know, Jan must be quite old now. He is he coming? He is. Yep, yeah. Jan will be here yeah. uh, um, a week on Friday. He's coming up. Good, good, um, good. yeah. He's coming up for the weekend, driving up with his wife. He's 86 now. Uh, yes, yeah. So, you know, yeah, she was older, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. must admit, I, if I do, I would like to actually at some point go, I'd probably like to see her before she died, but I don't know. Yeah. She was great when I last, as I said, the last time I, I went to see them, and it was at Catherine's house. So, um, and and she was, it was great to see her. It's as yeah. if I hadn't, you know, I hadn't seen her for 20 or 30 years, you know, but she actually was enormously friendly. Yeah. And it was as if we hadn't, you know, it was great. Just carried on straight away, you know. Well, that's know, it was uh, visually different. As if you've never left the room, you know. I know, it's crazy. But that's what that's what's nice. I mean, that's why I think the key thing to working with Stanley, I can say that now, but obviously they don't have to worry about that now, but at the time, is is getting to know his family. Yeah. He is a very much a family man. I mean, you did have your lunches, you know, you were at Abbott's Mead and you were there during the day. You'd always have to raid their fridge to get, you know, whatever you wanted for your lunch. And that's what he said. Here's your lunch. He'd open the fridge. Somewhere in there there's lunch for you. <laughs> and that's what it was like, you know. Brilliant. It wasn't necessarily arranged, but he did, when they did have cooking, I heard later, because the, their house in, in, in St Albans, I kind of got for him. Because that's one of the things I had to do. The last things I did, 
you know, it was in the middle of The Shining. He said, oh, I want to move. I want to get a house. I need to, I need to, uh, so could you find me something? So it was great. I went around. And the r- restrictions were, you know, not too near traffic because he was worried about his dogs and cats. I mean, he had lots of cats and three dogs. I mean, the cats, um, and he's all, be- he's buried with his dogs. Yeah. Um, and his cats, <clears throat> literally, there were cat flaps in every room, even into the projection room. There was a cat flap. The cats could go anywhere in the house. You'd have to, they'd always be opening and closing. You know, you suddenly know there's a cat, there's a cat with you. And, you know, a few times that I did do uh, working out the reels and screening because they needed somebody to do it. And Andros gave me quick lessons on how to do it. And I don't think, I think I did it okay. But obviously I did because what I can't remember what, what I, what films they were, they weren't big, many wheelers, but they were short films. But, you know, that was all right. In his own cinema, yeah, yeah. So you, get to, you basically get to do every. You, you basically get to do everything. It sounds as if it was a fascinating grounding in in the entire absolutely. industry. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I remember doing a. Uh, I remember doing a a, a, a a film for for BBC, and uh, it was in Birmingham. We were filming at, at Spaghetti Junction had just been built. And uh, and we were and I was doing all the stills and what I was doing was stills for the for the production for promotion. So what I would do is and when they did their rehearsals under the camera, I'd sit under the camera, lie on my stomach and take the pictures. I'd be in the position as near as I could be to the lens, right? So I didn't set up my own tripod or anything, but I would do the pictures like that. And I knew nobody did that. And I knew the only reason I got to do that is because. I'd work for Stanley Kubrick, and they must have thought Stanley would do that. I'd always thought it would be a good way of doing it, and I know I must have been there. They must have, the first time I did it, I could, I could feel it in the back, and they were all going, what's he doing? What's he doing? And, and I got fantastic compliments at the end. They loved the pictures, and I took some of the actors out and did some of the scenes on my own, with the, you know, doing that. And they thought that was great. And they must have thought the only reason I got away with this is because I worked for Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. And then did you, what was your route to directing then? Um... Well, I'd always wanted to, I mean, I wanted, I came to work with Stanley because I wanted to write. I wanted to write, I wanted to write really. But I, I you know, and I've actually weirdly, uh, during COVID, I was actually paid to write a movie script. And actually, weirdly, this is the first one I've actually ever been paid for. I've worked on a lot of scripts with other writers and with, you know, I've worked in that area. And I'm now wanting to, you know, before I drop off the perch, I would like to get there's about three movies I'd love to write and get them done because I think they're good. I mean, whether they're made or not, it doesn't matter. But the point is, this this movie I've written has got into a into a sort of log jam in in hollywood and and yeah. it's not and, and i just thought you know and i've told them i said you know this is not what i want to do and in fact i'm, I'm thinking of just doing it rewrite rewriting it i've got a co-writer i work with who's yeah. a sort of actor who does the film who who teaches film here and we've worked together for a number of years now and it and it's good and we have a good sort of relationship and that's kind of how i i'd like to be doing that but if you can get paid for it it's great because it does help but if you're not you know it's tough and you have to find out other ways of making it work no absolutely absolutely it's always been the same i don't think it changes much it probably does it, it does it changes for you obviously if you're steven spielberg or you're somebody big and you, you've got a, a body of work that's interesting and it's different i mean you know it's sort of yeah why do you think people are still sort of? Because I, I would, I would guess, if not the most talks about director, <laughs> then yeah. Stanley's definitely one of them. So, yes, he is one of them. Yeah, I mean, he's because he was such a powerful individual. I think you know. I mean, if you think of Francis Ford Coppola, you know, the people who are not necessarily you know, looking for scripts to direct, they they've done. He's done his jobs. He's done it. He's obviously old now. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, people were doing it. Scorsese is still doing it, and he's doing what he wants to do. I mean, he, uh, I think um, there are some really great directors, and but they're all different. Yeah, and they have their styles, and they have their ways of working. And I think you know that's kind of 
that's some of them are still going. Yeah, which is great. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Stanley would still be going if he's if he was alive today. I mean, he'd be still doing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but he he does take a long time. And you know, I can see where people get pissed off, and and a lot of crew get tired of it, and crew come and go. You know, you. Uh, but and there were people that you know stuck with him, but you know, obviously, and a very good choice. And and um, uh, but you know, I think it's a strange business. I mean, it's it is really luck yeah. that makes it work. I mean, I remember going to the Edinburgh Film Festival one year and, and listening to uh, a friend of mine called Tim Bevan, he's a producer, where they started working title. And Tim, you know, was talking about it, and he said. It's nothing to do with who you know and what you know. It is to a certain extent, but it's the luck. You have to be lucky. And, you know, that's the way it works, I think. Absolutely. And, but if, you, if, you're, if you're riding the luck wave, you've got to keep riding it. You can't just step off it and go off into a different... Or if you do, you then have to start again on another, on another journey. I mean, my journey is being quite weird, but the narrative is clear for me what I wanted to learn you know, having edited magazines, uh, and being a fashion photographer, it's all now coming out because people are talking about it. And my pictures are suddenly being talked about. Uh, but it's nothing I really have promoted and done physically. Yeah. You know, I'm not make. I'm not, a photo I mean, I'm not, a, I'm a photographer now. I still take pictures. I use this a lot and I have some digital cameras and I love taking pictures. But I just do it as a personal thing now. I don't do it for money. And no. uh, I do it, and so therefore it's um, yeah. I I took a different route. No, but I'm not no. I'm not worried about it. It was you know we used to we used to, years ago you know, when the, one of my production companies I had in in London when we were we were just near the, just on the edge of Soho and and um, you know we we put ads one year into Kent's all these for the trade magazines and things so, you know we just put our name and our telephone number and they rang up and said you don't you, you want to do something else you've got to think of some snappy title you've got to think of some promotional thing so we sat down and drank a few bottles of wine and thought well what can we call ourselves you know so we called ourselves gifted generalists <laughs> everybody hated us for it they thought we were so arrogant now everybody's a gifted generalist everybody <laughs> <laughs> if you talk to anybody in the film business, they've got other jobs. Got any, in any other business, they all everybody has other, does other in, other interests. Even if they're just a gardener, whatever it is, it's you know everybody's a gifted generalist now. Yeah. And so I kind of laugh about that really yeah. because they thought we were so arrogant. You know, what well, these arrogant pricks think they're they're <laughs> gifted. <you know? laughs> but it's worked, <laughs> of course. But you know. That's fine. It's great in the in the nineties and the and the beginning of the the two thousands. You know, whatever yeah. they call it, the nineties or. This is fantastic. So for you next, you're pull, pulling together a book. That's right. Yeah, no, that yeah, I sort of. It's just going through. I'm I'm writing it like a script, so it has a narrative, and I'm dealing with areas like my beginning of my life and what it is where I come from, what how it how it all came about. It's my creative journey. And so a lot of it is kind of different. It's interesting, it's different, it's it's not very commercial. it's not it's not necessarily commercial. I'm trying to make it more of an artistic event. With you writing it as a script, do, do you foresee it being a TV series or a well, uh, I have a I have a dream, right? But I keep thinking <laughs> when I do this, somebody like Brad Pitt will pick it up and option it and think, "Wow, this is an interesting story." This guy's <laughs> done so many different things and met so many people. Not well, out of yeah, just film. chapter three, Kubrick, you know, and, and and well, exactly, it's that. I mean, and in a way, there's lots of stories, but I'm doing them all. I'm not necessarily. I don't want to write masses of stuff. I want to do sort of just like page anecdotes as it were yeah. so there would be stories and there would be narrative and i would uh, you know and sometimes probably maybe invent a lot of the dialogue but whatever it is it has to be that for me to work and i that's what i'm trying to call it and i'm causing are you familiar with uh, the the words passing place in the highlands have you been on single track roads no oh they, right yeah they, yeah so they have what's place. called 
Yeah. Yes, they, they have these and they have signs up. Well, I have been thinking initially of calling it Pausing Place. And I did it with this guy, Tom Clark, an, a, a, an artist. We actually recreated one. I took the te text and he just, he's like a poet artist. He's quite famous. And, um, and so I did it and I did it as a photograph. And I've got to, he's on my list today to ring and see whether I could use the name and, and his photograph, which ah. I took. So I took it. It's my photograph, but I never really have. We, I, we never had any contract or anything. It's too much of an artistic. It was a journey we went on together. So, so I'm thinking of calling it that. And you know, that's how it will work. I cross over a lot. Yeah. Various in in in, in that area. So and the, you know and also because I also edited. We started magazines. We did a thing called Deluxe, right? And that was the first fashion punk magazine. And that, you know, it was funded by a Coke dealer in Paris. It, you know, and it's uh, basically everybody did. We had artists to do. The first one was done with Peter Blake. Then we had, um, then we had, uh, um, uh, Hockney was lined up, Dali, um, you know, all those sort of, years. I was doing it like interview, like, like, um, you know, that whole sort of, I mean, it was all to do with hip and fashion yeah. and punk, and initially, and then we then we started that, and then we we did another. Uh, we we got bored of it, got a bit complicated, and so we found this guy called Stephen Bentink, who, uh, when he was twenty four, became the richest man in Europe, right? Very rich uh, Dutch toff, and he we then started a magazine called Boulevard. And it was the first ever magazine to be charged a pound for, you know, and it was that. And basically what we did, what we started was ID, because I was part of that. Oh, right. ID, and the face. Tony, you know, you know, it was ridiculous. You know, that's what in Instagram is what started everything, the independent photographic in the magazine market. And that's what fascinated me at one point and then I went on and then I went back into to doing lots of stuff when Channel 4 started I set up a production company and we all started making loads of stuff for Channel 4 and that's you know I was doing pop promos before that and that's what Working Title were doing they were doing pop promos at the same time as me that's why I know them and you know basically they say we've got to make a, a hundred pop promos because that will give us enough money to make our first movie and that's what they did and Channel 4, they did Beautiful Laundrette and all that stuff. And and now, you know, the rest is history. Yeah. So working title and enormous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or well, they've all been bought out by Universal. So, you know, they're they're happy living in Los Angeles, making shed loads of money. Yeah, and they've retired and they're enormous. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I know, exactly. <laughs> so, that's, so that's the sort of, that was kind of where I came. And then, so therefore, when it all ended, I mean, I just got bored of it. I just got tired of doing tv it just didn't do it for me anymore and so i then decided to come back up here so therefore i came and lived here and started working out of here and then did all sorts of things like there was a big media association we set up in the highlands we we're going to try and open a studio here i became part of all that kind of stuff going on on, on up here and, and that's that happened what I've been doing. when did you move up about 20 years ago Right, okay. okay. I just got, I had an office here, it was in this room, it's not, it's not my office anymore, but it, it was, in, I mean, I just thought it would be, kind, it'd be good to do it. So digital age, things were starting to happen, and, and you, don't, you didn't necessarily need to be in Soho or wherever. But ultimately, in the end, you still miss, you still have to network, you still have to be around people, and but I find a lot of people come here. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, and in that sense, it works. But I also, you know, I've got a, a, a kind of nice little team of people that we work, we're trying to work and trying to do things. And I've been kind of mentoring a lot of people. And that's kind of what I do maybe you know, more. It's almost like you've uh, gone into the Stanley mode. Of people are coming round to your house and, and your... I have, I have, I have slightly. Yeah, I know it's weird. I don't know why, but <laughs> it's not deserved. But it just is strange. Yeah, you're right. Wow, very odd.
Well, and wonderful, and wonderful. Well, uh, Norrie, thank you very much indeed for your time. 